Okay, so I showed you the slide last class. Uh, the, over, the, the basic concept of cell signaling, we're gonna go over a few different mechanisms of cell signaling today, but all cell signaling really follows the same three uh, themes. The first is reception, then we have to um, do transduction, which is just a fancy way of saying we gotta pass that signal on to then get the response, which is what we actually want to do with that signal. Um, basics of reception, you have a ligand molecule. A ligand is a very fancy way of saying a signaling molecule, it is the message. That message has to bind to some sort of receptor. That receptor um, could be in the cell membrane, which is the kinds we talked about last class, but we're gonna talk about um, today is that you can have intracellular receptors, receptors that exist inside the cell. Anyways, whenever you have the ligand and the receptor binding to each other, the receptor will get a shape change. That's an important um, theme to understand. That shape change is what will then uh, I compared it to like a game of pinball last class, like that game of this shape change will then cause the transduction to happen. And the transduction is just really, again, just like a game of ping pong or not ping pong, <laughs> nothing like ping pong, pinball, or even like, um, you know, dominoes, like one domino, it's another domino, it's another domino. And it goes along the signal transduction pathway. Okay. And then that transduction pathway leads to some sort of cellular response. And I said that cellular response, the main thing I want you to key on was the turning off slash on of genes. Um, or it could be like um, turning up or turning down um, certain enzymes, certain proteins. That's another very common response. That's the basic idea. So building upon that, uh, let's go over intracellular receptors. So here is an intracellular receptor. So Intracellular receptor, it's a receptor that lives inside the cell. So here's your intracellular receptor, as opposed to a receptor that would um, reside in the cell membrane, intracellular receptor. So intracellular receptors are gonna specialize in binding what kind of ligands? Think about that, what kind of ligands, like here they're showing the hormone aldosterone, what, what, what properties would this hormone or any sort of hormone need to be for it to bind to an intracellular receptor? It's a really important concept to understand. Peter? Yeah. Nonpolar. Nonpolar non or hydrophobic. Because the inner part of the cell membrane, that, you know, the yellow fatty tails, those are made of fats, right? Fats are nonpolar. They don't mix with water. They're hydrophobic. So you gotta have a molecule that is um, either nonpolar or um, typically nonpolar, but also really small. If they're super small, they're small enough where they can kind of squeeze through those fatty tails, even if they're technically polar. And then they would bind to um, that intracellular receptor. And when that happens, you get something appropriately called the hormone receptor complex. They call it that because it is a hormone bonded to a receptor. Uh, what makes something a hormone? And, and to be sure, not all of these molecules, these molecules that can bind to intracellular receptors are hormones, but a lot of them are hormones. If you think back to, um, uh, uh, yeah, we talked about last class. What, what, how did it, what, what, was, what was unique about a hormone as opposed to some other sort of ligand, some other sort of signaling molecule? Had to do with distance local versus long distance communication. So if I, if I wanted to communicate with the hormone, would I be trying to do local signaling or long distance signaling? Luke? Long, and how do I do long distance signaling? Bloodstream, good. So hormones, they get released and they travel long distance by, doing, by going through the bloodstream. Okay, anyways, if you get the hormone receptor complex, so then this little like halo here, this is representing that like you have a shape change here, this shape change. So we have had reception, right? Here's reception. And uh, what's unique about this example is reception and then transduction is, is done by the same molecule or same complex because then transduction would be represented by this hormone receptor complex going into the nucleus and what's in the nucleus? Well, DNA is in the nucleus. And then when we get um, uh, part three, which is the response, 
the response that I, I kind of told you about earlier would be the turning off or turning on in this case, on in this case, uh, a certain gene. So it, this uh, hormone receptor complex, they uh, they call it a um, a transcription factor. I'll, I'll teach you more about transcription factors when we go over um, in detail, like protein synthesis. A transcription factor will do transcription. Uh, if you remember from like freshman bio, what was the purpose of transcription? What do scribes do? Transcribe. What are we what are we doing there? mRNA, yeah, that's what you see right here. So transcription, you're making a messenger RNA copy. That's a, a copy of that gene that you're wanting to use. And remember, the purpose of genes is genes make proteins. So don't lose sight of what we're doing here. The purpose of what we're doing here is you have a hormone aldosterone. Aldosterone's goal is to make certain proteins. In this case, anybody, anybody know what aldosterone does for us, like that hormone? You can like write the book. You, know, you don't have to know it, but... Luke, yeah. yeah, the kidneys, yeah. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's released by uh, your adrenal glands and it, it regulates like blood volume. So this will do something with like blood volume. You know, again, not super important, but the idea is this hormone, this little tiny molecule can eventually cause proteins to be made. Any questions about that? Very important kind of theme to understand here. All right, let me make sure I said everything. Uh, another example they're giving, um, uh, hor like examples of like, okay, hydrophobic messengers would be steroid hormones. Steroid horm hormones um, uh, typically are, not, are hydrophobic, they're nonpolar. And uh, thyroid hormones are another good example. Anybody know what the thyroid does? You can do some different things, but like the, say it's like a thyroid problem, what, how does that like usually present for a lot of like doctors and stuff? Luke? Metabolism, yeah. Thyroid hormone plays a big role in like regulating metabolism. Anyways, don't have to know that exactly, just if you're curious. Uh, yeah. Okay, moving on. Yep, so it's secreted by the uh, adrenal glands and um, adrenal glands. I mentioned this with like epinephrine, add renal on top of the, the renal referring to like your kidneys. Um, and that's where it's regulating um, specifically water and sodium flow, which um, if you change the amount of water and sodium, it has to do with like um, osmosis, like change the amount of sodium will change the direction water will flow and that will change whether or not you produce more urine or you like retain more water if you don't, you're not drinking enough water. But uh, anyways, the point is that that aldosterone, that, that uh, signal in the molecule activates genes or it could technically turn off genes if it's a different molecule. Okay. All right, so the next kind of system I wanna talk about, um, and really it's, it's the same system but that we've gone over like at 5.6a last class, but I want to key in on, um, the, the main purpose of this slide is to key in on um, step two, the signal transduction um, part of uh, cell signaling. Because we, we've kind of ignored that so far. I kind of said it just kind of happens. But this is, what, this is trying to show that signal transduction pathway. So you get that signaling molecule. Here, this is just a, a normal, like, uh, this would be a membrane receptor because the protein receptor is in the membrane. Signaling molecule binds, you get a shape change, and uh, you then get, uh, in this case, you would get a relay molecule. What this relay molecule does is it's gonna activate, it's gonna turn on something called a protein kinase. So I, I want you to know what a, a kinase does. A kinase adds phosphates. Okay, adds phosphates. Uh, you, here's how you can remember it. Kind, kind has a D at the end. And if you don't think about it too much, a D kind of looks like a P. Sure. <laughs> I'm saying 
Uh, anyways, <laughs> so this relay molecule turns on the first kinase in this pathway. These different signal transduction pathways, they can have many different kinases. They're showing only two kinases, mainly for um, space purposes. A lot of pathways will have three kinases. That isn't that important for you to understand, but if you're curious, a lot of times it's like a, it's a pathway of three different kinases. And as I said, kinases add phosphate. So this active protein kinase is going to um, attach a phosphate group to a second, your second kinase. Where does that phosphate come from? You know that, that phosphate comes from ATP, right? The third phosphate in ATP. So if you remove a phosphate from ATP, it then becomes ADP, and then you see that phosphate attached to this protein kinase. Um, the attachment of this phosphate will make this inactive protein become active. Why is that? Any guesses? Why would adding a phosphate just like turn on a protein? It seems like a weird like voodoo thing happening. Phosphates have a negative charge. So why, how would phosphate have a negative charge somehow turn on a protein? Try to think back to like amino acids, man. I told you the different categories of amino acids. Proteins are made of amino acids. Thomas? It has to do with like electrons, has to, has to do with charges. So if I add, I, I just stuck a bunch of negative charges of this protein. I just, here, have this nice flow of electrons, a bunch of negative, and on this protein, you have a bunch of charged amino acids that are either repelled or attracted to the, that negative charge I just added on that phosphate. I get a little carried away with my negatives. But that is, that, that, that's what causes the shape change. The shape change is caused by the, the negative charge on that phosphate, either again, attracting or repelling certain amino acids that make up that protein kinase. And the combination of all that makes this protein kinase become active. This enzyme is now open for business. It's an active enzyme. It can catalyze reactions. In this case, because it's a kinase, another kinase, it's going to turn on another protein. So it's gonna phosphorylate another protein getting that phosphate from the third phosphate ATP, and that will turn on what we call the active protein. The active protein is what's carrying out the cellular response. So really the goal is we want this signaling molecule to turn on this protein, and this protein is the actual protein that's doing the cellular response. Maybe this active protein could be like an enzyme, like a key enzyme that is like trying to um, do some sort of metabolic reaction, trying to break down glycogen so we can get glucose and run away from a tiger. Um, anybody know why we fuss around with this? Like why, why wouldn't there be some way for like this receptor to somehow turn on that active protein? Like why, it kind of feels like you have a bunch of middlemen here. Like why, why fuss around with like all of this? Any thoughts? Luke? Yes, good. So benefits of a phosphorylation cap, uh, uh, cascade, uh, the first would be amplification of signal. Because think about it. This thing could turn on this thing. The, like each step, they, they call it a geometric increase. A geometric increase is um, sort of similar to an exponential increase. It's not quite as steep of an increase, but it, this will speed up the response. It's kind of like you're recruiting a bunch of different workers to uh, tell that active protein. Okay. Um, also think about it like just mechanically, like this thing is all the way in the cell membrane. This active protein could be anywhere in the cytoplasm. It would be very difficult and inefficient for this, even this one molecule to go and have to tell this entire active protein to do its job. Um, there's, there's a second one, um, uh, per, like, um, benefit of this like phosphorylation ca cascade of the signal transduction pathway, what, what would that be? Any thoughts? It's related to amplification of, of a signal. Think of like a dimmer switch. How does a dimmer switch work? What's a dimmer switch? Like, like I have only like on, off, a dimmer switch can kind of like change the lights. Um, 
it's easier to uh, easier to regulate this pathway. It's easier to kind of like turn on, turn off, make it either like ramp it up a little bit, ramp it up, uh, slow it down a little bit. It's easier to regulate this pathway when you have more molecules in the in the in the uh, making up the whole system. Okay, so um, let me make sure I said everything. <clears throat> Amplifies the, you know, just again, just a few molecules and create a large response. And then it's easier to coordinate and regulate. So those are your two, one, two, your two benefits of the signal transduction cascade. Think of like a game of pinball or falling dominoes. One molecule, usually with kinases, one molecule phosphorylates another, which phosphorylates another, phosphorylates another, which eventually phosphorylates the actual protein that you want to do the job. Okay, and adding that phos that that phosphate group, it changes the shape of the protein into the active form as opposed to the inactive form. Okay. Um, Dephosphorylation, what would dephosphorylation do? If phosphorylation activated things, what do you think dephosphorylation does? Tur turns stuff off, right? Right, turns off. And I'll show you that, um, uh, 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 I think in the next picture it's got, I have it. So, there you go, set everything there. Did it have it on this picture? Oh, I left it off in this picture, yeah. One more thing to add on this picture. Um, protein phosphatase, PP. Not PPP. Um, protein phosphatase does the dephosphorylation. Dephosphorylation. So if I want to turn off this pathway, I need to remove the phosphates. It's actually beautifully simple. If the, adding the, phosphor, uh, the phosphates turn the proteins on, removing the phosphates would turn them off. Protein phosphatase... Um, turns it off, and um, phosphatase. Taste. What does taste make you think of? Maybe a taser. Do you. The, the purpose of a taser is to inactivate somebody, right? Like that is. I think that's the only goal of a taser. Like I don't. I don't think there's like any other purpose of a taser other than to like inactivate somebody acting the fool or whatever. So a, a phosphatase, protein phosphatase, it's a protein that tasers these proteins. It removes the phosphates, so we inactivate those proteins. All right. So that's what this slide is trying to say. Um, so inactivates, but also like for reuse. So we, if like, for example, if this protein kinase, this protein kinase, has turned on this protein. If I then use the phosphatase to like remove the phosphate, that kind of then will recycle it for when you get another signaling molecule coming in. So it's related to, to turning it off, but it's not just like you turn it off and then you throw the proteins away. You can then recycle those protein kinases and use them again. Okay. All right, um, I want to talk about second messengers. That's the purpose of this slide, second messengers. Um, and they do exactly what the name would make you think they do. They are the second messenger. Well, who is the first messenger? The ligand. The first messenger is the ligand. The ligand, I showed you G-protein coupled receptors, GPCR, last class. That ligand binds to a receptor that is coupled that is holding hands in a, in a relationship of some sort with a G protein. And when this ligand binds, this G protein, which was here, will get activated by adding GTP. That's why it's a G protein. It gets turned on by GTP. GTP moves across the membrane to um, a membrane enzyme. So adenylocyclase, this is an enzyme. And uh, let, let's break down the name of this. Adenolyl, what would that be referring to? Any thoughts? What does that sound like? Adenine, Adenine right? 
So it's referring to adenine, adenine, cyclase. What do you think cyclase is doing? It's yeah. Cycling it. Cycling. It's it's literally turning this into a bicycle. <laughs> no, it, it's taking what it's taking ATP, something made of adenine, and it's going to turn into a cyclic molecule, a molecule that's like got like a ring structure. Cyclic AMP. What do you think the M and AMP stands for? What do the T and ATP stand for? Tri. What did the D and ADP stand for? Di. So what do you think the M and C, A, and P stands for? Mono. So there is C, C, A, and P. It's C for cyclic. Cyclic. Right? That's where the cyclic is coming from. M for mono, it is a cyclic, it's a ring structured uh, molecule that has mono one phosphate and it's uh, made primarily of adenine. Anyways, just if you're curious, cyclic AMP, CAMP is a second messenger. Uh, second messengers, they, they amplify our signals. They're very similar to our uh, signal transduction cascades. Amplify is not how you spell that. Uh, there you go. It amplifies the message. So, di so different mechanism, a different kind of uh, way of controlling, of getting your cellular response than a signal transduction cascade where you're adding the phosphates, but the same idea. It's trying to amplify the message. So these second messengers, um, they're very small molecules. And what's the benefit of them being small? Like so what? They're small. Oh, and water soluble. So let's take the first one. Why is it beneficial that um, second messengers are small? Who cares? Like I'm small. You don't hear me bragging about it. You know. That was just okay. Did you? They uh, well, they're already in the cell. Like we're not really worried about getting in the cell membrane. Right? Um. Picture like a, sometimes like in the NFL, like running backs, it's like helpful to be like really small. Fast. fast, yeah. Think of this. They're trying, they're a second messenger. They're Paul Revere, right? They're trying to move. They got to move. They got to get around stuff in the cytoplasm. So they want to be small. That makes them um, nimble, quick, fast. They can move easily. They diffuse easily. So they're small, so they diffuse easily. Now, um... Why are they water soluble? Why do we care that they're water soluble? Who cares? Why even like why even why do I even bother mentioning that? <clears throat> they're, hydrophilic. they're hydrophilic, okay? Who cares? Why do they need to be hydrophilic? Who cares? <laughs> they need they need to dissolve in water, that's true, but like why do they need to dissolve in water? Like why would that help them move around? I'm just throwing shit out you can start crying. <laughs> cytoplasm is made of water. Cytoplasm, which is where they're located, this is the cytoplasm, is made of water. So, like, it's not made of oil, right? They're not, you know, like, if they were, if they were like, oil-soluble, that wouldn't be helpful because then they couldn't move around in the water. So they're water-soluble and small because that helps them move around, and the cytoplasm is made of water. Okay. This second messenger, its job is to turn on to communicate with the protein kinase A. Protein kinase A is going to notice there's a bunch of arrows here. This would then be where you have the signal transduction cascade. Signal transduction cascade. In other words, what I'm trying to tell you is this pathway, like where you have the second messenger, it, it's not like an either or. You can have both of them. So here you have a second messenger that will amplify the signal in addition to the signal transduction cascade amplifying the signal. So like, maybe this might help. This was the signal transduction cascade. I could like insert second messenger. Insert second messenger. 
This slide isn't showing the second messenger, but you might have the presence of a second messenger here. You don't, bless you, you don't always have second messengers. It just depends on the, on the, the signaling pathway, but um, you may have the presence of a second messenger there. Um, there you go. Oh, one last thing with a second messenger. A lot of times cyclic AMP is, is one. Um, ions are another good example of second messengers. It's like calcium can be a good second messenger, especially like in um, nerve cell transmission. Um, uh, second messengers play a really good role in trying to like propagate that like in, in action potentials and stuff. Okay, we got questions here? Uh, I'll make sure I said everything. Oh, they're non-protein. So all second messengers are non-protein molecules. That is an important detail to note. They're small, they're water soluble, so they can move in the cytoplasm, and they're not made of protein. Two most common ones, cyclic AMP, and um, specifically calcium ions are uh, the most common ones. Okay. Talking about cyclic AMP, adenylocyclase, that's what's taking ATP and making it cyclic AMP. And then I want you to know that the second messengers, they usually activate a kinase. No, that's their main job. The second messengers, their job is to talk to kinases primarily. Okay, uh, so another example, kind of bringing everything together here. Let's say if we revisit that growth factor example we talked about from last class, Growth factor helps things grow because it's growth factor. Growth factor binds to a receptor. So step one, reception. You get a shape change in the protein. This shape change will signal our signal transduction to happen via the phosphorylation cascade. The phosphorylation cascade is done by a bunch of different kinases that are adding the phosphates, okay? Kinases, kind, looks like a P, adds the phosphates. Those phosphates will then, in this case, enter the nucleus and they can activate a transcription factor. They don't always activate transcription factors. I need you to understand this isn't how like literally all signals work. This is an example. An example of this would be a transcription factor. Transcription factors turn on or off, turn on genes. This transcription factor that was activated by the kinase turns on a certain gene, whatever that gene is that this growth factor, whatever genes are needed for growth, that's what, the, that's what is being turned on by the transcription factor. Again, it's turned on, that transcription factor is turned on by that phosphate that came from the kinase, and then you get the, you get the um, transcription of messenger RNA, and that messenger RNA makes a protein. So mRNA then becomes your protein. You got questions with this? I got a question for you. This, this transcription factor, um, let's say this transcription factor, they're not showing it explicitly, but let's say this transcription factor had to come into the nucleus. Um, do you think this transcription factor would like more likely be um, well, let me ask you this. This transcription factor, it's a protein. It's a protein, and proteins are typically gonna be uh, polar, water-soluble um, uh, molecules. How is this transcription factor able to get through the, um, the double bilayer, the double uh, membrane of the nucleus? They're not showing it here. They're kinda, they kinda are. How do you think it's getting in there? I told you that in order to get through the cell membrane, you gotta be non-polar, right? And I'm telling you what, polar thing is somehow moving through two different membranes to get into the nucleus, and I wanna know how is that even possible? Luke? Uh, pores. pores. This is a nuclear pore. This nuclear pore allows um, polar hydrophilic molecules to go through. Uh, all right, that's, that's really most of everything. Make sure I set everything here. Yep. 
And again, um, another cellular response is the regulating the activity of enzymes. So we can either turn on or off genes, or another example of the cellular response could be um, turning on or turning down enzymes, right? Making them, uh, uh, the enzymes be more or less active. Any questions? It's the last slide.